Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. In this video, I'm gonna share with you the top five skills and traits of pro photographers that have allowed them and has allowed me to take my photography to the next level. If you stay till the end, I'll give you an easy tip on composition that's easy to implement and yields instant results. If you're new to this channel, my name is Simon Dantremont. I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make videos about once weekly on photo tips or taking you behind the scenes in nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. First off, pros know that perspective is more important than settings. People send me photos all the time and ask me to critique their photos. The number one problem I see is they're taken at the wrong angle and the wrong perspective. Shooting at eye level is often the most boring perspective you can shoot at. It does work in some genres of photography, like portrait photography, because you want to be at eye level with your subject. But pro photographers know they need to move their angles and perspectives around. You can really add a lot of interest to your photo by mixing up the angles. Getting down on the ground, getting at a higher angle, hiding halfway behind something. You can exaggerate objects in the foreground with wide angle lenses by getting really close. Moving around also allows you to put something in the foreground in front of your subject or in the background behind your subject. It gives a much more 3D look to your photos and adds more things of interest in the photo. A photo of a beautiful sunrise with nothing else in the photo, it's not a very dynamic photo. Find something interesting like I found in this pattern in the sand to put in the foreground of your photo. It adds a wonderful look to the photo and gives something interesting to put in the photo along with your subject, which might be the sunrise or the sunset. Do you have a favorite angle or perspective you like to shoot at? Put it in the comments below. I'd love to see it and other people would love to know as well. So my tips to implement using better angles and perspectives is when you see your subject, look up, look down, look left, look right. Try to see what interesting camera angles you can use to make your subject much more interesting by adding something in the foreground, something in the background, or shooting it from a really unique perspective. Tip number two is pros use the histogram on the back LCD of the camera. Photography is painting with light, but our eyes aren't very good judges as to how much light there is. Trying to eyeball how much light there is in the exposure can lead to several problems like under and overexposing your photos. Conditions can also fool you as to how accurate the back LCD is for determining if your exposure is right. When I shoot Milky Way photos at night, the screen looks really, really bright and is a really poor judge of how bright my exposure is. The inverse happens in the daytime under bright light on your LCD. The histogram is a much more accurate measure of how bright your exposure is. So what is a histogram? A histogram is a graphical representation of how many pixels in your exposure are dark, medium, and light. The left-hand side of the exposure graph is pure black. The farthest right-hand side is pure white. The middle are the medium tones. The height of the graph shows you how many pixels there are in each brightness category of your photo. That's actually not the most important thing. The most important thing is the left-hand edge and the right-hand edge. If your exposure is touching on the left-hand side of the histogram, it means it's pure black. There's no information left in the photo. If your histogram is touching on the right-hand side, that represents pure white. Again, no information in your photo for that exposure level. It's pure, pure white. There's nothing you can do to reclaim any detail. So clipping on the left-hand side, the darks, means that there's no information left. It's pure black. This is bad unless it's intentional that you have pure black parts to your photo. These photos here, like a Milky Way photo or a photo of this mink, can include some pure black because those are dark, dark shadows and there's no detail there that I'm interested in showing. That's fine, but unless it's intentional, your histogram should be off that left-hand side. There should be a little bit of a gap so that every part of your photo has at least some information, even if it's dim and dark. The opposite is true in that unless you want parts of your photo to be pure white, you should avoid the right-hand side of your histogram touching on the right edge, which means that's pure white. If you can pull back a little bit from that edge, that means there's still information there. And if you lower your highlights, you can regain some detail. Now there are some types of photos that work with pure white, like this photo here of sandpipers, having the outside of the photo in pure white is fine and works great. But unless this is intentional, you should avoid clipping your highlights on the right hand side. In general, try to expose your photos that the blacks are separated from the left hand edge and the lights are separated from the right hand edge. Somewhere in the middle is the best distribution of pixels and lightness and darkness in your photo. 
One tip to implementing histogram is to expose your photo so that the highlights are almost to the right hand edge, but not clipping. This technique is called exposed to the right. Another technique is to turn on your highlight alerts or blinkies. That is blinking lights on your LCD panel that tell you you've overexposed your photo. If you turn these on, you'll know when you've overexposed and you can reduce the exposure to make sure your histogram is not touching on that right hand side. Tip number three is pros invest in lenses more than cameras. Many people will think that having the best cameras is what's important in photography. Most pros will think that having the right lenses is what's important. Wide aperture lenses allow you to blow out the background. Sharp lenses allow you to get great detail. Long lenses allow you to blur out your background and isolate your subject. Wide angle lenses will distort the features close to the lens and minimize those in the background. Now good camera bodies will give you some benefits like better low light performance and better autofocus, but don't splurge on a camera unless you've got a really good lens. I'll take a great lens on a cheap camera body before a great camera and a cheap lens any day of the week. Also, great lenses are a better investment. Camera bodies depreciate really, really quickly where good quality lenses depreciate very slowly. The cycle for upgrades in technology and lenses moves much more slowly, so good lenses hold their value for a long time. I bought this 500mm f4 lens seven years ago, and when the new 500mm comes out for the RF mount for Canon, I'll be buying the new one, but I'll be selling this old one for 80 to 90% of what I paid for it. But I also bought a full frame camera four years ago, and when I sold it four years later, I got less than half of my original purchase price. So good lenses are both important for helping your photography and better investments than camera bodies. So the tip here is buy nice or buy twice. Your first big splurge should be on a great lens. Then you can update camera body and get more lenses as time goes on. The next tip is that pros excel at composition. When I started out in bird photography, I found that all my bird photos looked the same. Bird on a stick, bird on a stick, bird on a stick. I thought to myself, I'm not improving as a photographer making nice artistic photos. Which genre of nature photography includes a lot of core elements of good composition and photographic techniques? Then I thought landscape photographers. So I started out in landscape photography to improve my bird photography by including some of the core elements of good photographic technique, especially composition. I learned about the rule of thirds, the golden spiral, using patterns, symmetry, colors, light, and great compositional techniques to improve the quality of my wildlife and Milky Way photos. I often use the rule of thirds in composing my wildlife photos to make sure that my subject is in the right place in the photo. I also use it in my Milky Way photos. If you look at this shot, you'll see that the path and the line made by the cars and the roads below are opposites, but symmetrical. It adds what I think is a really nice effect to this photo. Also think about whether or not your composition should be vertical or horizontal. I like vertical for Milky Way photos, for example, because my subject, the Milky Way, is often up and down. But I like horizontal for flying bird shots because the birds are usually flying left and right across the frame and I want to leave more room in front of the bird than behind it for it to fly into. A few tips on how to implement compositions. Number one, rarely is the center of the photo the best place to put your subject. Try putting your subjects off to the edges and the sides to make it more interesting. Also, don't crowd the edges. Don't put your subject too close to the edge. Make sure there's a little bit of room. Another way to explore compositions is to walk around with your camera in live view where you look at the back LCD while walking around and trying to see whether or not there are interesting compositions to find. Number five, over time, pros will develop a look to their photos. Now, I used to think that having a look might have been a bad thing. I told a friend once, all my bird photos looking the same. People can identify them that they're mine before seeing my name. Is that a bad thing? His answer was, Da Vinci had a look and that wasn't a problem. So now when people tell me I love your work or that they knew it was my photo even before they saw my name, I think that's a good thing. So when photos have a look that represents your style, it makes them unique, it makes them identifiable, which is great for developing your brand as a photographer. If your photos look like everyone else's, there's nothing to differentiate you in the marketplace. There's nothing that allows you to charge a higher premium for your photos because they look so unique. Don't overly worry about needing to force developing a look. Over time, as you get better, you will find there are things that you do really well and that you are able to implement really well. When you do, try to find ways to maximize those. Try to find ways to implement those in more unique ways that helps develop your style and your look. Maybe it's dark photos, light photos, black and white, really close, really far and environmental. Make your style unique and make it be your calling card.
So for example, for my style of wildlife photography, I like to have a clean background, maybe some backlighting with tricks of light, but I also like having some nice action, a unique pose, a wing flap, a wing position that shows some of the fine feather detail, or really some funny action. For my Milky Way photos, I like shooting the Milky Way above a recognizable landmark in the foreground and make the two work together really well. Those elements allow my style to be both recognized and to stand out and makes it much more easy for me to commercialize it as well because it's unique in the marketplace. I promised an extra tip and that's sometimes less is more. I see some photos where there's too much in the photo. It's not clear what the subject is. There's just too much going on. When that's the case, try to simplify your photo by either getting closer to your subject and having it fill out the frame so you know clearly what the subject is, or take a longer lens where you can really isolate a subject, and that way you can cut out some of the clutter, makes it clear where your subject is. So when you're in doubt, when you're struggling trying to find a composition, think about getting closer to something unique, putting a longer lens on and try to isolate it to see whether or not you can make it clear what your subject is. And don't be afraid to crop. Some people think cropping is a sin. I don't mind cropping my wildlife photos to the core subject, taking out some of the things that are less important in the photo. Remember, if they're not adding to the photo, they might be taken away from it. I hope you have an amazing day. Go out there and take some great pictures. Use your imagination. Try to differentiate yourself. Go out and take photos that are unique to you.